Welcome back to the final episode review of Erie, Indiana. The day has finally come where we'll be looking at episode 19 called Reality Takes a Holiday. As always, if you're new here, I've done an episode review on the entire series, so feel free to watch my previous episodes. This episode originally aired on April 12, 1992, and was directed again by Ken Coapas, known for directing The Santa Clarita Diet, The Office, and Parks and Recreation. It was written again by Vance DeGeneres, who is Ellen DeGeneres' brother. The episode starts off with Marshall and Simon and his family sitting at the dining room table. Marshall's family is trying to get Marshall to go with them to see a scary movie, but Marshall doesn't want to because he's 13 and in the phase where he doesn't really want to hang out with his family anymore. Cindy is reading the movie review from the newspaper, and Marshall questions Cindy when she became such a cinephile, and Cindy tells Marshall to watch his mouth. Edgar then says to Marshall that he never seems to want to hang out with them anymore, and asks Marshall if they embarrass him. Marshall says no, not exactly, but that Simon and him have some stuff to investigate. But Simon says he'd like to see the movie Revenge of the Corn Critters with them, and Marshall says okay to him and to enjoy the movie. Simon says if he's sure, and Marshall says yes. Marshall's mom asks Marshall if he could take one day off from his paranormal quest. Edgar then says that they are a bit concerned that Marshall is losing sight of what's real and what's important. Marshall says he knows what's real and what's not, and sometimes he thinks he's the only one around there who really does. His family gets ready to leave, and Edgar says last chance to go with him, but Marshall says he's not going to change his mind. It cuts to Marshall's family and Simon leaving to go to the movie. Then Marshall notices a crow on his mailbox, so he goes to it and opens it up and pulls out a script for a show called Eerie Indiana, Reality Takes a Holiday, Final Draft. Marshall opens up the script and begins to read it. He realizes what he's reading is exactly what him and his family just said before they left. Marshall heads inside his house and all of a sudden his family is back at the table, waiting for him. Marshall says what's going on, you guys just left. Edgar then says last chance to go with him to see the movie. Marshall reads the script and repeats what Edgar said. Suddenly Edgar shouts that he just said that and we hear the director shout cut. And we see the director and it's Joe Dante who was actually played by himself. Joe Dante tells everyone to start from the top and Marshall says he doesn't have a dog named Toto, but if he did, he'd be saying, Toto, I don't think we're in Indiana anymore. Marshall says that things have gone from the ridiculous to mega voodoo prime time. After finding that TV show script in his mailbox, all eerie broke loose, but good. Joe Dante calls to Marshall, but he's calling him Omri, which in fact is the actor's real name who plays Marshall Teller, Omri Katz. Joe Dante asks Omri if he's alright and says maybe he's tired, but it's television, it costs too much to be tired, and that they're on a tight schedule and really behind, and tells Omri if he can help him out, and asks him to be more professional. Omri then says, what are you talking about, and who are you, and shouts what's going on, and what happened to his house. Joe Dante calls for lunch and tells Omri that they'll pick up where they left off, and touches Omri, and Omri gives him a look, and Joe Dante says, Mr. Sensitive. Omri then bumps into the prop master holding his jacket, was played by Julius Harris, who was known for The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew Mysteries, Trouble Man, and Live and Let Die. Sadly, he passed away in 2004. Omri tells him to give him back his jacket. The prop man tells Omri that if he loses it at lunch, that it's his butt, not his, and walks away mumbling how no one respects the prop man. Omri then sees his family walking by and asks them what's going on. Marshall's mom, who is now going by her real name, Mary Margaret, tells Omri that she thinks he's blowing his lines on purpose. Simon, who is going by his real name, Justin, tells Omri that he can't postpone the inevitable. Omri says what's that supposed to mean, and who's Omri? Mary Margaret tells Omri to give it up, and no one likes a sore loser. Edgar, who is going by his real name, Francis, tells Omri that his lines aren't that hard to remember. It's not like they're doing checkoff here. Omri says what's Star Trek have to do with this, and who's Omri? Francis just thinks Omri is being a method actor, and they all walk away from Omri. We then hear Cindy scream and slap Justin, and Cindy, who is going by her real name Julie, tells Justin to keep his hands off. Justin then tells Julie it's because he's short, isn't it? Julie says she's not going to take this from a sexist pig 9 year old and leaves. Justin is laughing and takes a call from his cell phone. All of a sudden we hear Dash ask Omri if he's lost something, and Omri says yeah, his life. Dash says, no, no, that's after lunch, and tells the girl fans to leave. 
Two of the girls were actually played by Riley Weston and Denise Richards. Dash says it's good that he's getting used to the idea, and Marshall says what idea and what happened to his house. Dash says that after today, he'll never need to know, and walks away laughing. Omri then sees Justin shouting into his cell phone. Justin tells Omri that his teacher gave him a D in history, and calls his agent, and tells Omri that she's going to be history. Omri calls Justin Simon, and tells him they have major eerie weirdness here, and where the secret spot is with all the evidence. Justin tells him that the secret spot set is behind him. Omri tells Justin they should move the evidence to a safer place, it might fall into the wrong hands. Justin tells Omri to stop kidding around, that he's scaring him, and tells Omri he needs meditation. He says Guru Yogi Sharirma helped him through his Care Bear fiasco. Omri tells Justin that he's Simon, Simon Holmes, remember? And that he's Marshall Teller, to think, to not let them get him too. Justin tells Omri to stop it, that he's just mad that Dash is going to, but stops himself from finishing his sentence. Omri says what? What are you talking about Simon? Justin says nothing nothing, and that he has to go, and he gives him the girl's information, and tells Omri to get it together, he's just making it harder on himself. Omri says making what harder? Justin the lights go out, and Omri heads outside. It cuts to the studio outside, and Omri is looking for Simon. Just then, we see the set for the world of stuff, and Omri hears a familiar voice. It's Mr. Radford, and he calls Omri Marshall Teller. Omri asks Mr. Radford again what did he call him, and Mr. Radford says he called him Marshall Teller. Omri says he's the only one that called him that. Mr. Radford offers him a black cow drink in honor of him being his first customer of the day. Omri tells Mr. Radford that something weird is going on. He doesn't know what happened, but something is definitely wrong. He says that somehow Erie has become some sort of Hollywood studio, and his family and Simon think they're actors on a TV show. His house has exploded too. Mr. Radford asks Omri what exactly is he saying. Omri says he doesn't know what he's saying. Mr. Radford says he'll check the papers. Mr. Radford says that when they have a dilemma, they just read the papers and it will tell them exactly what to do. Omri says that's the script, that's what made everything go weird. Mr. Radford then shows Omri the script and tells him they are doing exactly what the script is saying. Omri asks what the script says on the next pages. Mr. Radford checks, but it's only blank pages. He says if they stick around, they might send some more pages. Sometimes they do that when they make changes. Omri questions they. Then Omri realizes if this is a script, then there must be a writer around somewhere. Mr. Radford says that there's some logic to that, otherwise people would be saying whatever they wanted and it would be chaos. Omri looks for a name on the script, and sees the writer's name is Jose Schaefer. Fun fact, the name of the character who plays the writer Jose Schaefer combines the names of the real creators of the show, Jose Rivera and Carl Schaefer. Omri takes off and Mr. Radford wishes him good luck and that he'll save his cow. Omri finds the writer's office and goes in. The secretary greets Omri, who was played by Sachi Parker, who was in Back to the Future and Scrooge. Omri runs past her into Jose Schaefer's office, and we see Jose, who was played by Mark Blankfield, who was known for Saved by the Bell, Charles in Charge, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Omri asks him if he's Jose Schaefer, who wrote Reality Takes a Holiday, and Jose says that actors aren't really allowed there. Omri says he's not an actor, then Dash says it takes a big man to admit that, and starts laughing. Omri says he needs him to explain some things to him. Jose says that as long as he's there, to sit down, and tells Omri they've been going over some of Dash's ideas for the big scene. Jose says to picture this. Omri is in his front yard, and Dash says to remember that he stayed home from the movie, and Jose says that's very important, and all of a sudden Omri sees Bigfoot going through his trash, and Dash has been on Bigfoot's trail all morning long because there's a bounty on it for $5,000, dead or alive. Then Marshall gets his camera ready to sneak up on Bigfoot. Meanwhile, Dash, the new star, is just out of view of where Marshall is, and Marshall comes up behind Bigfoot, just as Dash takes aim and shoots. Just as Bigfoot ducks, Marshall catches the bullet and staggers and dies. Dash asks if she should blast him a few more times just to make sure he's dead. Jose says, great idea, they want to make sure he's good and dead. Jose then says he smells an Emmy. They ask Omri what he thinks, and Omri says, what do you mean when you say dead? Dash and Jose start saying other words for death like pushing up daisies, rigor mortis, etc. and start laughing. Omri says that every kid dreams of being the star of their own TV show, but take it from him, it's a living hell. Erie has collided with a parallel reality called NBC, 
and was being written off the show, or killed off the show. We see Omri getting his hair brushed by a hairstylist who was played by Virginia Watson, who I remember from Don't Be a Menace. We hear Julie saying to Mary Margaret they have to demand meatier scripts and better characters for women. She says if she has to say one more airheaded big sister line, she's going to vomit on a producer. Omri then asks Mary Margaret if Dad knows about that tattoo. Mary Margaret says Francis and starts laughing. She says he could care less. She tells Julie it's a midlife crisis and she'll know what it's like in 10 years. Julie then says 15. Mary Margaret apologizes to Omri for being harsh before and that it's tough being killed off a show. She says she cried for days when it happened to her on another show. Omri snaps at her and tells her, don't you understand I'm getting killed here? Omri says he's not going to stand still and let Dash shoot him, but Mary Margaret shushes Omri and says he might hear him. Omri says, you're really not my mom and calls him all pod people and runs away. They ask where he's going and the hairstyle says he's probably going on a crime spree and they start laughing. Outside, we see Omri running past Justin, who is reading a paper saying Network nukes Omri, and Francis getting a massage. Jose and Dash arrive in a DeLorean, and Jose asks Francis if he's seen Omri, and Francis points to where he ran. We see Omri listening to Jose, telling Francis how Omri stormed in his office, demanding they change the scene of his death. Francis says he was a bit of a handful himself at that age, but Jose says if they don't get Omri back to shoot that scene, the Network will cancel everyone. Dash says to Jose that just worry about the script and that him and Justin will find Omri. Omri says he's come to the end of the line. He's been hunted, lost, nowhere to hide. But then he saw home, the safest place there is. But like everything else, it turned out to be fake. We hear Dash calling for Omri on a golf cart. Omri sees them pull up to the house set and Justin asks Dash what makes him think he's there. And Dash says Omri is the kind of guy who actually thinks that there's no place like home. Omri runs, but Dash tries to tackle him, but gets knocked down, and they start wrestling. Omri yells at Dash to tell him what's going on. Dash says if he lets him go, he'll tell him everything he knows. Omri lets him go, but then Dash gets on top of Omri, and he tells him it's time to go back on stage. But Omri says why, he's just being led to slaughter. Dash says it's not big enough for the both of them, but Omri kicks him off and tells Dash that he's behind this whole thing. Dash says he's just a character in a TV show, he's no more real than him. Justin then tells Dash that People Magazine want to talk to him, which gives Omri a chance to run, but Dash says the script says he's dead. Then Omri realizes if the script says he's dead, then maybe he can change it. Omri calls Jose Schaefer on the phone and makes up a lie about his DeLorean, saying there's been some sort of accident. Jose instantly runs out, and the secretary asks him what about the script changes. Jose says that this is more important, basically, and Omri sneaks into his office looking through the secretary's desk first, then onto Jose's desk. He then hears the door open with the secretary returning to her desk. Omri had to work fast. If Jose wouldn't change the script, he'd have to do it himself. Omri finishes the script and gives it to the secretary to get to the studio. We see Omri return to the set and meets up with director Joe Dante. Joe tells Omri to put on the blood squibs so there's lots of splatter. The prop man begins to put them on Omri, but Dash tells the prop man not to worry because they'll be doing the scene all natural. Omri then wonders if the new pages are in. We see the secretary making copies of the new script pages. It cuts back to the teller's dining room set and the actors getting ready, and Francis saying he thinks he's made the right decision, that the show must go on, even if it has to go on without some of them. Omri says thanks dad. Dash pops in and tells Omri bang bang and Omri tells the assistant director to remove Dash. The assistant director was played by Leland Orser, who's known for the X-Files. The assistant director removes Dash. Omri asks if there's any new pages of the script, and Julie says sarcastically she hopes not. She's worked all night on her big line. They all start laughing. We see the secretary walking the new pages to the set. They're about to shoot the scene, but Omri asks Joe Dante what his motivation is, and Joe Dante tells him his motivation is he gets shot and dies. Just then, the secretary comes in and gives the new pages to the set. Joe says it only affects Omri. Dash reads the new pages and gets upset, and Joe Dante is about to yell action, but Dash tries to stop him from saying it, but it's too late. Omri closes his eyes, and when he wakes up, he's back with his real family. Edgar was saying they're a little concerned that maybe he's losing sight of what's real and what's important. Marshall is shocked and just keeps looking around. Marshall's mom asks Marshall if he's looking for something. 
She snaps her fingers and Marshall snaps out of it and calls her mom. And Marshall's mom says yes. Marshall gets up and looks out the window and sees everything is back to normal. Then Marshall tells his family that he'd like to go to that movie with them. Marshall's family gets excited and they get ready to go. But then Marshall notices a page of the script on the floor. He picks it up and reads it and it's exactly what just happened. It cuts to Marshall's family getting in the car to leave. And Marshall says his name is Marshall Teller and that he's learned an important lesson about reality. In this life, you can either follow the script they give you or demand a rewrite. But in Erie, Indiana, Weirdness Central USA, you've got to be ready to improvise. And it ends with Dash ripping up the script saying you win some and you lose some. And that concludes the final episode of Erie, Indiana, and what a way to end the show. This is my favorite episode in the entire series. I loved how they were using their real names in the sets. It was just a fun way I think the show was saying goodbye, not taking itself too seriously for the ending. Well, it's been so fun reviewing the show for you, and I hope you guys enjoy this little trip down memory lane as well. My goal in starting this was to help people remember the show because it was so underrated and ahead of its time, and I wanted to keep the memory alive for Erie, Indiana. I appreciated the comments you guys left and the subscribers I gained. It truly means a lot to me, even if it wasn't a lot of comments. I'm still grateful for every one of them. It kept me going to make these videos for you to enjoy. So I thank you for watching, and stay tuned for other classic TV show reviews and other content later on. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.